Okay. Yes, Mike. I uh, I remember you. Hey, you remember me? I do. Didn't realize it was you. Glad to hear from you. Oh, good to hear from you, sir. I haven't totally jumped on. Uh, North Campus stole me, but uh, or I guess Lawrence still did, and then they don't. That doesn't exist anymore. So, I'm every once in a while I'm undone, Woody. If you want me in the spring, just look me up. <laughs> Well, I'd love to have you, but I'm not in charge of hiring me anymore. Okay. Well, I won't blame you then. Okay. You're, you're, okay. We're recording. Um, do you want me to start? My name is Mike Siegel. Um, I am a, a instructor at long time instructor at Georgia Perimeter. I've taught history at Georgia Perimeter. I uh, started, I guess, about this time uh, in 94. And so it's been, uh, been quite a while. Um, I teach um, history on occasion and on occasion geography. Right now I'm teaching off and on and done what he, but I have taught in South Campus, on campus, and uh, the now defunct abandoned campuses of Rockdale and Lawrenceville. Um, as I said, I'm an instructor of history, and so my uh, day job is something different. And I am rector of, of uh, research and data at a company called Landmark Communications. It is a, for the type of business that it does, it's, it's medium sized, we have about eight or nine people. And so uh, I'm director of a department of one. And so I run the, uh, the database for, for, main, for uh, campaign plans for, uh, for polling. And today I want to talk a little bit about polling, about uh, what it is. Um, you, you can do it now. Next one, uh, what is polling? Uh, how polls are conducted, a little bit of the math. If you, if you showed up and get any math, you might be disappointed. Uh, and then I want to talk about polling, the, some of the constraints, some of the problems, uh, why it's, it's uh, uh, not a pure science. Um, polling, what is polling? No. Polling is more than just USA Today graphics. Uh, it's more than just the uh, the race, the race uh, between two people or three people. It's, it's uh, details in that, uh, polling, statistical work from polling. Um, a lot of times you'll get polls that claim to be polling the same number of people with slightly different results. There's a great website, political website, called Real, po Real Clear Politics that uh, combines the three or four latest polls of a particular race or of the president's approval rating or or a Congress approval rating, and it'll give you sort of a sort of a feel of what different pollsters feel about a, a particular question. And so you, so it's more than just, uh, but polling is, is more even than that. But polling is not quite a science. What I mean by that is that if it was strictly by the numbers, then um, then you wouldn't get the poll picture. If it's it's not exactly an art form either, because the math has to be done, it has to be done properly. If our mistakes in polling and polling analysis or mistakes in how polls are conducted, uh, more often than not, it's a question on, uh, on the, the factors or data that goes into the, into the number crunch, that goes into who they surveyed, how they weighted it, and things of that sort. So most of the problems are, uh, are math related, so it can't be, a, it's not a pure art form. Polling, as I've seen it in the last four years, and I've done dozens, probably, 60, 70 polls of one sort or another, some statewide, a couple out of state, um, a lot uh, in, in local communities, house races, Senate races, counties, things of that nature. I found uh, polling is more like alchemy. Uh, it, is, it is sort of a, a mix of both art and science, but if it's combined the right way, it can become a, a very useful tool. A good poll is a survey or a snapshot of public opinion at a precise time and place. But in the right hands, it can be a very useful tool, a very powerful tool. What do I mean by snapshot? Um, polls are usually done over a short period of time, sometimes within a couple, they, they, if there's, there's certain methods where they may only take an hour to do, to get 800 surveys or 900 surveys in. Uh, there's, there's methods that do that and do it very quickly. You could have an event happen the next day, and that could totally change people's opinion. You could have uh, a poll done on 
on Monday, and then some scandal comes out the next day, and the numbers may move a little bit. And so all, all really giving you is just a snapshot of that time and place moment. In 1992, I was watching a race, and the AJC did not like one of the candidates. And so they did a poll right before the guy's big media buy was going to go through. And so they did a poll, but they, they embargoed it, and they didn't release it for a couple of days. And so the guy started for a week. He, he covered the airways. He had all commercials all over the place. He uh, started talking about how wonderful he was and what he was going to do and how, um, and, and, and before the ad buy, people didn't know who he was. After the ad buy, everybody knew who he was. AJC released their poll after his ad buy was done in order to show that no one knew who he was. And if you read just the headlines and you didn't check the date on the poll, if you read just the headlines, you thought this guy spent $100,000 and didn't do any good. Well, the reality was the poll was a week old. And the reality was that once he started making the buys, people knew who he was, and he eventually did win. This was uh, Paul Coverdale in 92. And, um, and so, so basically it's just a snapshot of a particular place and time, um, and events before and after. Uh, Roy Barnes, uh, his uh, daughter was in a non, non-fatal uh, accident. His grandkids are going to be reached from the hospital today. Uh, nothing major, but it made the news there's going to be a sympathy uptick for him of a half a point or point or something like that nature. And so events, um, this is going to be enough for him to win? Probably not. But is, is it going to, if there was a poll done today, would it reflect something different than a similar poll done two days ago? Yes, because of events beyond the control of, of the pollster or anybody else. A uh, good poll can show trends. Uh, pros- uh, they're often not appreciated by the consultants and clients, and, and rarely appreciated by the people, by journalists and people who don't go into the details. Um, what I mean by that? Clayton County. Um, older people in Clayton County are majority white. The county is majority black. If they have an issue but polling will tell you which race is prominent and, and, and other statistical analysis will tell you which race is prominent based on, on age or gender or, or where they live in the county, things of that nature. If you go into the details, you find that old people, old white women, are care about Social Security. And young African-American men, who are the majority of the people that are, that are say, under 35, care about jobs. The, the polling will tell you what issues they care about. And, and there'll be a racial component, there'll be age component, and, and going into the details of the poll, details of the cost tabs, will uh, will show you those things. If I gave you all the data I collected on a poll, uh, it would bore the daylight of the reader if somebody actually read it who was interested in it. But if someone was a uh, involved in a campaign, or someone was a consultant who, who knew how, how to use that information that, that would, uh, that would provide, they, they could, they could get some interesting insights. Yeah. The, um, he's probably down six or seven points. And my last slide will talk about some of his problems. Um, so not so much public statistical analysis will tell you what problems he faces and, and the polling will, will, will contribute to that. And what it does is it creates a picture of what percentage he needs to win, what percentage of white voters, black voters, people, what, what who new voters he needs to bring in. And um, he'll get, and, and, and that's on one of the last slides. <laughs> I'll talk about that. But he has a, a difficult a uh, difficult road to hoe. And part of the issue is that you have to say, how does he find someone who voted for McCain who, two years ago who now thinks the Democrats are doing a better job than the Republicans? Not a whole lot of swing voters who voted for McCain two years ago who now think Obama's wonderful and we need to vote, vote for some more Democrats. And by the same token, Obama in certain camps was doing, was, was, was able to say, well, it's easier to get Republicans who voted for Bush in 04 in a place like Ohio. 
and bring them over to vote for Obama than it is for Barnes to bring perhaps Republicans over from from 08. Um, sometimes the numbers are what they are, and you just and and the, the good thing about polling and statistical analysis is that it gives you a sort of snapshot. They said this is the fact of life. This is what you face. This is this is what what you have to do. And then you can decide for yourself whether, as a candidate or a consultant, whether it's doable or not. And sometimes uh, it's like in Clayton County. Uh, the there's no Republican Party worth talking about in Clayton County. So all the whites vote in the Democrat. Most of the whites vote in the Democrat Party. And so you have African American split between two African American candidates. But if you can convince the whites that one of the African American candidates is more moderate than the other, then you can create a, a coalition and win. And so, but the math will tell you. The math will tell you if you run a Republican candidate, Clayton, he's going to get clobbered because there's not enough conservative whites there for for even the Republicans to even put up a candidate in Clayton County. And so the the, the swing vote. Are, are which of the two African American candidates, and that's where the where the the, the older white women uh, play a role. You you probably have a dozen counties around the state that have African American majorities. You have uh, Fulton is not. The cab might be an African American majority. The issue is uh, urban areas like the cab and Fulton. You have significant numbers of white liberals, and so that changes the dynamic a little bit. You have uh, situations where um, the African Americans are more conservative than the white liberals in the county. So what you have is you have a fight between white liberal and African American, and African American is actually more conservative. And so, so you have, a, or you have situations where the Republicans are so small in the cab that they went and pulled Democrat ballots voting in Cynthia McKinney. And so these people would normally always take Republican ballots, but there was no Republican race, so they they voted against Cynthia McKinney and Hank Johnson. Is uh, one he got about twenty thousand votes out of out of uh, uh, Republicans? Yeah. What you say was the Detroit Clayton. Clayton. Okay. I'm, I'm giving that sort of as an example. There's other places. Uh, they'll use because they'll use polling. They'll use polling, and, and but what will happen is you'll have two two candidates that have a different style. And you'll have one that says, well, my goal is to expand the African-American voter base in order to get me elected. And that was uh, Jewel Scott and, and her husband. And um, and I forget the uh, the sheriff that was there. Um, uh, Hill, I can't remember first name, but the sheriff there, was to expand the African-American base and win. And then they were running against other African-Americans who were going to expand their, their reach to other communities and so they were getting Asian, both had the Asians and Hispanics, and some of the older whites still live in Clayton. But they both used pump. They both they both knew what the they knew what the geography of the land was, and they also knew what the math was. And so they knew that if they could fulfill their plan, if they could get more people to come out to vote for them that liked them, that they'd win, and vice versa. Um, Polling is, as sort of as I say, it's more than just a horse race. It's the interrelationship of the data. And the value there is that both sides will do polling if they have any money what, what, uh, worth, worth spending. And, um, and so both of them, in most major races, they both know what the reality is. They know what the numbers, what their targets are. They, and they, they create, uh, give me a next slide. They know what the, uh, uh, they know what needs to be done, shall we say. Talk about the science of it. Uh, to liberal arts people who do not understand statistics, when I say I can survey 800 people in a, in a house district, or, 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 or for that matter, 1,000 people statewide, and I can create a valid poll that has a degree of confidence of 3% or 4%, they say, well, that's crazy. 
They never pulled me. They never called me up. How can, how can you generate a, a legitimate survey if you only have 1,000 responses or 300 responses? Well, believe it or not, and I'll let math professors explain it better than I, but believe it or not, you can get a legitimate statistical analysis uh, provided you have with a with a provable, scientifically provable uh, level of confidence. I use the type of sampling, but uh, and that gets to a little bit later. But if but if but and I use the term degree of confidence. Um, USA Today will say degree of error or variance of error. Um, degree of confidence is, is is the proper term. We do a poll of a group, uh, we have a population of 10,000. We get 500 responses. We get a, a degree of confidence of about 3%, 95% chance, 95% chance that the actual number is within percent. And so the, the degree of confidence is 3% up to that, it, that it's within the, the number that we're getting. And, um, theoretically, if you, if you really go to the books and you study statistics, you see the funny charts and the and the and the, the, the the curve things like that. But uh, but all you really need to know is that it works. And I've done polls that have been off by one percent. And at the time, we shook our heads and said that can't be right. But the election the next day, that came out was perfectly right. Uh, we were the only poll. My poll was the only poll that said uh, uh, deal was going to be handled. And uh, every other poll was done was not done to, to our level of satisfaction, and they showed Hannibal was going to win. We did a poll that weekend, and we showed that deal was going to win by one or two points, so we're off by that about, about that mark, about, about one point. And uh, and so it, it, it can be done. You can inc if you can incre if you increase the sample size, you can increase the level of confidence. Uh, in standard polling, the weighting can be. Uh, derived, you can do properly, uh, can be calculated. Uh, I'll talk about weighting in a second. What I mean by that is that uh, you know what the what the ideal goal is. You know more or less how many people are going to come out to vote. You know more or less what the racial background is going to be, more or less the gender background by looking at previous elections. And if you have something to compare it to, then you can weight it properly. Some people say, well, what, why, what do you weigh against this or that or what, what do I, why do I uh, just flip a coin and decide how to weigh it? No, it, it can be done, done properly. If it's done properly, then you'll get, get, a, get a valid poll. Uh, proper house district may only need 300 responses. Um, statewide, 800 responses. And you may not think that's a large number, but if it's weighted properly and if you get people that are from a wide enough demographic, then, then that's not a problem. Polls can identify possible trends. If I have a poll early in the race, early in a race, and I say that everybody knows who Roy Barnes is, and the 11 hate him, but no one knows who Nathan Deal is. And some people like him because they voted for him in the primary, but the vast majority don't know much about him. And I do a poll a month later or two months later, after people started an ad buys and, and things of that nature, I can see how effective the TV advertisements are, the direct mail. I can see whether whether people know more about Neil than they did before, uh, whether Barnes' attacks on Neil are effective, whether Neil's attacks on Barnes are effective. Um, and we did a poll months and months ago, and basically it said, said that. They, people like Neil, they didn't know anything about him outside his district. Uh, people either really liked Barnes or really didn't like Barnes. And that drives the campaign plans, that drives the message. If, if I'm not going to be able to persuade Barnes people to vote against him, but he is under 50%, if he's like 40%, then I can target not his core people, but I can pick up those demographics that I found in polling that are they're undecided. And if I go after that group, spend all my money, and that small group of people are undecided, then I can drive up his negatives and keep his uh, his support uh, level. Barnes's people, they look over deal, they said nobody knows who he is. So what I, all I need to do is to find the, the vast majority of people don't know who he is, and I need to do bad things about him to see if I can drive up his negatives. But why should I spend any money on my positives? Because everybody has made up their mind whether they like me or not. But if I make the other guy look bad, then the people who are undecided will come my way. 
and and so the so the uh, polls can drive the uh, the campaign. Polls can be combined with other statistical data. That's yeah, fine. We're fine. Last one. Uh, polls can be combined with other statistical data. Uh, estimated turnout, uh, early voting trends, um, and that can provide insightful in who, who wins. One of the things that I'm doing now is people have early voted. That information is recorded by the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State knows within four hours if you've early voted. I early voted last week. It should be in their database today. I can take that information statewide. I can match it up against people's voting history in the race. And I can tell you uh, what areas have a high percentage of African American turnout versus years ago, or low percentage. I can I can tell you uh, people have already voted. What their last partisan election was? Are they more likely to vote Republican or Democrat in a primary? And I can I can use that information to sort of get a, a feel for who's going to win or who's leading. Um, in the in the deal race, one of the things we did was I didn't know what, who they're voting for, but I could assume the congressional district deal was from was going to vote for him in large numbers. And I knew that they did a lot of early voting in the night in North Georgia. And so I knew he had a shot to win once I saw that his counties were coming in large and counties are normally going to vote for Karen Handel were not coming in nearly as large. And so that told me that it was going to be, that it was going to be close, that it, that it was not. And when the polling, uh, uh, that we did uh, proved out. Then, then we sort of went on a on a uh, uh, plank and said that yeah, we think Deal has a good shot of winning and probably will win by a couple a point or two. And, and we were right. Yeah. You can do it too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before the election, there was several information. Do you use this new information now? Mm -hmm. Are you the public? Are you allowed to do that? I can, but it's not useful to the public, but it's useful to the campaign. Let's say I'm running for office in DeKalb County. Let's say I'm running for judge. Be nonpartisan here. I'm running for judge. And I know that there are 5,000 people who've requested absentee ballots but haven't voted yet. But they have a piece of paper on their t kitchen table and they're looking at the names. And I can have somebody call them up and say, please vote for me. You don't know who I am. Nobody cares about the judges, but I'm on the ballot and I know you're going to vote because you have a ballot in front of you. Hi. I, you might think it's called their dinner and he's already had 20 million of them. You're like, oh, I remember that name. Uh, pe like pe people who get People who get angry tend not to vote. They tend not to vote against the person who makes them angry. They just tend not to vote. And one thing that happens, and this is psychology, political psychology, but, but what happens sometimes is, uh, and, and we were running against this guy, but a, a friend of mine ran a race, and they called people multiple times, like dozens of times, on a machine that called people, so it was virtually free for him. So they called these people up like, four times a week. And it was a down ticket race, and they bugged the daylights out of the voters, and people hated them, but they remembered the name enough to vote for his guy and not my guy. <laughs> because they'd never heard of my guy, because they'd never heard of my guy, and, and so they voted for, for the other guy. And, um, but I, 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 and I, don't, I don't like bugging people. But but let's but but if I'm a if I'm a runner for office and I can get you on the phone and talk to you for two minutes, I and, and it's at a reasonable time of day, and there's some people that all they'll do is leave it on voice answer me, that that it will um, that it, that it's effective that it gets people uh, remembers you, and especially in down ticket races, everybody knows about Barnes and and Deal and everybody maybe even remember the people run for lieutenant governor and senate. But uh, how many people know people run for labor commission or public service commission? Uh, I voted. I'm ashamed of myself. I voted, and there was one of the judges' races. I didn't know who the people were, so I didn't vote for that in that, in that race. And, norm, and normally, I, I know who everybody is, but, but it was one of them 
They had six people. I never heard of any of them. And so the, sometimes it's just getting the message out uh, is important. Um, polling can drive the message, can drive the campaign plan. Polls in combination with other data can, can be even more can be even more useful to, to, to give you to tell you who's, a horse, who's likely to win or what they need to do in order to win. Um, Sometimes there are some races where where the candidate is up by 15 points, and the candidate the candidate that's losing knows they're not going to win, but they'll concentrate to turn out the vote. They'll benefit friends. They'll benefit other people that they're working with. Uh, Michael Thurman is not going to beat Johnny Isaacson, but Michael Thurman is going to work in his community to turn out the vote, which is going to benefit a lot of people who are friends of his. <laughs> And if he was not on the ballot, it, then, then they might not do nearly as well because he's going to turn out the vote for, for John Lewis and, and uh, Hank Johnson, and, and he has some personal support in Clark County, turn out some of those people. But narrow it a little bit. Yeah, and, and sometimes what you could do, you run for office for more than just winning sometimes. Sometimes if there's an issue, that's the only way you can get that issue out is, is to run for office and talk about that issue. And, but you have to be careful because if people view you as, as someone who's sort of crazy and you're running on one issue and you get absolutely buried, then the, there is a mandate, but the mandate is against you, it's not for you. So you have to, you have to be somewhat credible in the way you run. Uh, three kinds of polls. Live polling, which somebody calls you up with your name and said, I'm so-and-so, would you answer these questions? Expensive, old-fashioned, cost maybe $15,000 or more. Um, the new po type of polling that we use and, and is more, much more common is IVR. Some places call it uh, interactive virtual response. Some people call it interactive voice response. Essentially, you're, somebody is calling, a machine is calling you and saying, if you like Barnes, press 1. If you like Deal, press 2. If you're undecided, press 3. If you uh, don't like either of them, press 4. And some of you may have experienced that. The, the, the power of the machine is that it can call 10,000 numbers in an hour. And even though a very small fraction of people answer the poll, enough of them will answer it to become a credible poll. If you get 400, 500, 600, that's, that's more than enough to be credible. And the, uh, and it's very, and it's much cheaper than, than, uh, live calling, and it's just as accurate. We did a poll a while back where we did both kinds, and the number was the same. And so if all things being equal, we're gonna spend a fifth of the money. You can get IVR poll done for $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, depending on the size and, and, and the number of questions. And so it's only a fraction of what the life on. The, the new wave, which hasn't been proven yet, is using internet polling and surveying. The problem with that is not everybody has an email. Not everybody, it's, it's not as, uh, but that will be the way of the future. It will be even cheaper than IVR, but, uh, but it's not proven. And some people say that that, that might be the, the way of the future. Process in a nutshell. I'm trying to speed up a little bit. Am I a little slow? Sorry. That's okay. Process in a nutshell. Randomized data. Uh, good computer program can randomize the, the phone numbers for you and, and make sure you have just as many relative ratio as, as the overall. Um, in a house district, you, you might call every night because in order to get enough to, to make make sense. Uh, something statewide, you may call 20,000 or 15,000. Um, the people that are calling national polls, uh, even have to be a little more com complex than that, and they may call 50,000 numbers or more, trying to get just enough surveys in the right mix to make it, make it valid. Uh, IVR will take the sample, give me the data. I'll compare the sample data to the demographic ratios from a previous election. I'll wait it, which I'll explain in a second, but you must have a very, very good statistics program. Uh, I am not, a, I'm not, uh, I cannot do this with a pen and paper, let's put it that way. It has to be done with a good stats program. I use something called SPSS. 
15 years ago, one of the grad students, I used something called SAS. Uh, both programs are, are pretty good. The one I use, SPSS, is, is, is very good. And it's run by IBM now. This is what my spreadsheet looks like. You wanted some math. These are uh, a poll of Clayton County. This is the breakdown of people actually responded. This is the percentage of people who were supposed to be in each group. So we're supposed to have 22% of the people are going to be over 64. 12% were going to be, be younger. 60-40 uh, 60, 60, female male, and so forth. Yes. Are you male or female? Are you uh, your age range and uh, and your race? Um, what? No party affiliation. Because I already have that data. Because <laughs> I can take the phone number, and I can match the phone number back to the person's vote history, and I can I can sort of get a feel. But but the th but usually we do a lot more polling in primaries. Than, than in general. And so my poll may be only, in Clayton County, it may be only people who voted in one Democrat primary in the past. And so they may already be Democrats. And, and I'll ask a question sort of to see what, how hardcore they are. I may say, do you, uh, do you like Obama? And if they say no, then that means they're probably not hardcore Democrats. If they say yes, I love Obama, and I'm white, and I'm young, then that gives, shows you another description. Of, of where they're coming from. Well, Clayton, Clayton's just south of, this is near the airport, just south of uh, Atlanta, not that far south of here. But this is from the election four years ago. And so I'm weighting it toward what it was four years ago. Clayton, this is, this is, this is one, this is just a sample, and I changed the numbers, and I don't remember what district, but, but this is sort of a, this is sort of part of Clayton County. Clayton. Jonesboro, Riverdale, Morrill. But anyway, but you can go and you see that there's more female voters than male voters, and that more African Americans than whites that vote in that district. Um, people are sort of middle-aged who vote. Um, one of the things that will, is that if you go through some district, just by looking at it, won't tell you this. Because there's a lot of people that live in my neighborhood that don't vote. And if you don't vote, you don't count. If you don't vote, you're, you're, you're not, uh, not part of this. But this is what the percentage should be. This is what the percentage was. So I have to make this number essentially into this number. So I take this, multiply this by the sample size 171. Gives me these numbers. Then I uh, keep forgetting which way you go, but you take this number, divide it by this number, and that gives me that number. And so that number is what I use to weight. Now it's a little more, slightly more complicated than that, but give me the next one. So what I do is like for all, for the gender, for all the, the men, they get this number, because that's the weighting for the male. This number for weighting for the female in order to sort of normalize it, and so forth. Multiply them together and get this number. So the math is not nearly as complicated as what people say. The, it's looking at the data, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, but not, not so much more that, uh, uh, that overwhelms people. But essentially what, one of, one of the things that I try to talk, talk to people who are skeptics of polling, I say this thing, this math isn't that complicated. This math is not so complicated you can't understand it. And if you can get the weighting right, if you can get, if you, if the, if, if you think 50% or 55% of the voters are going to be African American, and that's a reasonable, under, reasonable, uh, belief, expectation, then you can weight it toward that. And if, and when you poll and you toward that, then you can get a reasonable, uh, a reasonable justification for what your numbers are going to be. Give me the next one. Biases. The problem with polling, one, not everybody fills out a survey. Some groups are better than others. This is a phone survey. What kinds of people in a household pick up the phone? Women. How about older or young people? Old people. 
The, the young, young people are cell phones. The young, the young people are at work. The young people are at the, at the mall. And so it's really easy, and, and even racially, it's easier to get white people to pick than, than, than African Americans. The, um, it's easier to get people who have money than people who don't have money. And so you have to wait against that. You have to, you have to alter your data to the point where, where it's, uh, you're going to get more old white women than you're going to get young African Americans. In other words, male. In other words. And so you have to, have to weight it toward that. And if you have, you may have a valid poll in every way, except you have a certain group that you need 50 and you only got two. <laughs> and those two are not, not representative of the 50 people that should be from that group. And so, so sometimes you just have, you have to call them again. And so sometimes what you'll do is you'll have a group that is, that is hard to get to and you'll have to call through that list more than once in order to, uh, in order to get enough numbers to make it work. Some people lie. Um, they don't always say what they mean. They have people, they, 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 uh, they're, you, I know on their data for a certain phone number what race they probably are and they'll tell me a different race than what the, what the, the specific number of what they are or age or something of that nature. So some people lie. Usually that works itself out. People lie one way and other people lie the other way and it balances out. But some people lie. <laughs> uh, changes demographic. You have some areas where certain groups of people are moving out very quickly and people are moving in. And so, so, so you'll have an area like Clayton County where um, a lot of whites are moving out, mostly the younger whites. And so, the old people are majority white, but, but, but people who four years ago were white homeowners in their 40s uh, have, may have long since moved, sold their house and moved somewhere else. And so the demographics some places change quickly. You have other areas like Rockdale County, a lot of African-American professionals living from DeKalb to Rockdale or to, or to Newton County. And so if you weight it toward what it was four years ago, Sometimes you're not you're not quite waiting it quite right. Um, Twenty four percent of the voters that voted in the 06 general election were African American. In 08, it was well over 30 percent. It's not going to be as high as 30 percent, but it's not going to be as low as 24. And so we're waiting everything to about 26, 27 percent. And 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 to some because we think there's more African American participation is going to be higher. In, in order to get it right. If the weight is not correct, uh, the only predictor of the future is patterns of the past. But the question often sometimes is what pattern do you go by? Do you go by the pattern two years ago or four years ago? If you have a special election or, or, or a SPLOS vote or a city election, what demographic do you want to do you want to use? Do, do you have a city that doesn't have a lot of city elections? Then, then it's hard for to figure out who are the odd voters who come out to vote for, for, uh, for city election. And, and so, but sometimes the weighting isn't quite right. And, and that creates problems. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes the press is both turnout. Or sometimes, it, but, and that's why, that's why everybody will say, oh, this is the most important election in a hundred years. They say every year. <laughs> they say, and, 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 and yeah, elections are very important. If it weren't for elections, I'd be out of a job. But, but the, um, but you got, you gotta, uh, you gotta take a little bit in stride. But there are some people who vote in every single election, who never missed an election. I have never missed an election. Since I was was old enough to vote, and and that doesn't mean I vote for everybody on the ballot, and that doesn't mean I vote for one party. Sometimes I vote multiple parties, and and there are some people that are that have been quite good leaders in Georgia that I cannot myself to vote for, or their opponent, and so so but there are, but there are people who always go to the election. If you can identify those people that core group of people and you don't have a lot of money, then it's better to spend the money going to them than the people who maybe vote, maybe not vote. And and in a depressed when this the election is being depressed because they think the candidates get it clobbered or they think their candidate's gonna win without too much opposition, 
than um, than than the the, the what is the summer warriors, the the, the part-time patriots, will will slip away, as uh, as Thomas Paine used to say. Um, another problem: not enough respondents. Uh, bad questions. Sometimes pollsters commit fraud, and fraud does happen. And and I'll talk about two cases in a second. The issue, but but you remember all the biases. Very few of those are math. Most of those are art. Uh, that, that that if you that if you understood how polls are created, if you understood how uh, the nuances, then uh, then you could sort of identify what possible biases within your own poll in order to correct it. And sometimes I go to my boss and I say this number doesn't look right, and he says I don't know what the problem is, but I'm but there's something wrong. And he says, well, can we call another 10,000 people? So sure. So we call 10,000 people, and instead of getting 200 responses, I now have 500 to play with, and it's much easier to, to get to a more correct number. Two cases of possible polling fraud that you may or may not have heard of. The Daily Cough hired a group called Research 2000, that, and the claim was, and you remember, I'm putting this on so I won't go to jail, won't be sued. But the claim was that they manufactured the data to please their clients so they could raise more money so they could pay for more polls. That was the claim. And the Daily Cost had a flip came out in Georgia that said we had just as many liberal voters as conservatives in Georgia, and we had just as many Democrats as Republicans, and that Roy Barnes was going to win in a landslide. And um, we knew that wasn't real. And I internally talked to my friends. I said, you know, this, this is not real. Now, uh, it was Research 2000. <laughs> yes, by Research 2000. Because what happened is they hired Research 2000 to go out to do the polling. And they um, didn't do a very good job. Well, what, what they did... Some of it they made up, but what they, the people at the bottom probably made it up. The people at the top did not weight it properly. They weighted it in a way that made it look better than their clients look better than ours. And if you have five companies doing the same poll in the same district, they should be within three or four points of each other. If one is really far off, there was an issue. And Research 2000 would not release their cross They wouldn't release released their data. And so daily cost is legitimate firm, but so they got egg in their face, but legitimate firm. They says, well, if you don't give us the, 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 the cross tabs, you don't tell us the data, if you don't show us that spreadsheet had, they had, had all the weighting. If you don't show us that, then how do we have faith that what you're doing is, is real? And they did have one poll that they did release that said Georgia was a very liberal state that had more Democrats than Republicans. And Barnes was going to win. And this was early in the year. And I had, we, my firm had done a similar poll on another, totally another issue. But we asked people, what's your party? Do you consider yourself conservative, very conservative, liberal, very liberal, moderate? And so I, my cross tabs that I had faith in, my, my one that I had faith in was totally different than theirs. And I had faith in mine, didn't have in theirs. Now, now if I had, if I had, Talked to some journalists, I might have gotten my name in that, in that controversy, but I only talked to internal people. But Daily Cost probably has another firm doing it, and so it's fine. I don't want to be too critical of them, but it, but, but it wasn't, it was an example of how some questions could be raised. The second firm, Strategic Vision, uh, the first one was more Democrat and more liberal. The second one is Republican, some equal opportunity here. Strategic Vision violated very technical statistical law called Benton's Law that states that when things are randomized, certain patterns arise as far as what numbers are more frequently than others. It's statistical, it's a, a accountant trick used to find um, people who fudge the numbers for, for white collar fraud, uh, something that only people in statistics would know anything about. Uh, apparently these people didn't. And when a critic of theirs looked at all their data going back a couple of years, four or five years, they found that they had violated that law, that certain numbers appeared more frequently than they should. They asked for the data to, to disprove, I'm, I'm alleging that you manufactured your results. 
prove me wrong, and, and they were unwilling to do that. Uh, both cases were legally unproven, but they're examples of concerns that give rise. Uh, my firm, we do not fudge the numbers. I do not do anything that will send me to jail, although they probably didn't violate any laws. They probably contract only, but... Well, 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 a candidate wants to uh, wants to run. Uh, he uh, collects some early money. He goes to us and he says, "I want to know if I can win." Before I go out and raise serious money, I want to know if I can win. And I and an opponent of mine, I'm, I'm challenging the opponent. And the opponent, we don't think the opponent's very popular, but we want to do a poll to see if the opponent is not very popular. And so they'll give us money. Three, four thousand dollars, depending on the district and the size. I can give them result in two or three days. Maybe the data collects maybe a day. My computer work maybe a day to make it look nice and pretty. Maybe maybe a couple hours. But I can give them a, a, a folder with the data within 48 hours or so, and and that will tell me uh, does my client do people know who he is? Do they like him? Their opponent? Do they know who he is? Do they like him? Should they should the opponent be replaced or kept? Uh, what's the racial or gender or age background of the supporter for the two sides? Uh, maybe I have an opponent that is, uh, his supporters are all young, but the old people really hate him. And I know if all I need to do is turn out the old people and I'll win. And so, make, so I can change my campaign in a way to maximize those areas where I have the advantage. And, and, what, and what he does too is if I give him a poll that's legitimate, that says he has a chance to win, then he will go to people who are thinking about giving him money and will say, this is what the poll says, the legitimate poll says I have a chance. And, and so people will, will, will hand, hand over the money. Um, people, some people give you money because they like you. Some people will give you money because they don't like the other guy. Some, but most people give you money because they think that you would do a better job than the opponent and they think you have a chance to win. I have plenty of people that says, we like you, but we think that there's no way you're going to win, and so so we're going to give you ten bucks, or we're going to give you a free ticket to uh, to to, to uh, we're going to give you a, we're going to pay for Chick Fil A dinner when we take you out to dinner or something. We're not we're not gonna, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna give you any real money because we know you're not going to win. And there are um, a number of very honest people running for office this year that are going to get under 40 percent of the vote, and they don't have a prayer, and the polls reflect they don't have a prayer, even though. Uh, you may agree with them perfectly. They're wonderful people, but they, but they don't have a chance. Uh, the only rate, only district that I think will change hands congressionally is the eighth. There's a small chance in the second. The Republicans will pick up the second. But uh, fourth, fifth, twelfth, or I mean thirteenth, uh, uh, Don Quixote, Jason Wendell. And and for that matter, the Democrats are running. In, against uh, in Gwinnett County, Democrats not going to win Gwinnett County. Democrats not going to win in, in the, the first district in Savannah. Uh, now they're running for rate, for reasons other than winning. Sometimes they're getting issues out, but um, but the uh, but their polls have, have reflected that they're they're not real. That is uh, Austin Scott, who was previously running for governor. Made all these connections, but only got five percent of the, his poll showed that he was getting less than five percent of the support. So he switched from running for governor to running for against uh, Marshall. And he was a Democrat who represents uh, Macon and South. Marshall is a uh, pretty conservative Democrat. So, and so what happens is the hardcore left Democrats are not going to be turned out to vote for him. Because they don't like them, and if you and the moderate conservative Democrats now have an alternative, so they're not going to vote for them. And the polls show it's, it's very close, but Austin Scott, the challengers ahead. The past people that run against Marshall were not as well positioned, and some years are better than others. Uh, second will be one worth watching. Twelfth, probably not. We're probably not any money, but when you talk about uh, people like four. And the fifth and the thirteenth with around here, um, the, uh, the Republicans are, are wasting their money. Um, 
no matter how good or bad they are, they, they the polls show that they're not gonna they're not gonna get more than forty percent of the vote, forty two percent of the vote. But by the same token, there's Democrats running in um, in uh, North Georgia, in, running in Raven County, running in in uh, Winnett, running in Savannah, and they have just as much chance of, of winning as somebody has beating John Lewis. And a, um, Georgia elections. Holy, tell me the racial breakdown of part of uh, party voting pattern. You can compare the early voting patterns, early voting patterns in 06 that tells you whether there's more or less African Americans than there were in 06. In 06, you know who won, so you know you you, you know what pattern needs to, what perfect storm needs to be created in order for one side to win or the other side to win. You also have somewhat of an idea of what the absolute number of voters are going to be by looking at the numbers four years ago. If you know the turnout and you know the number of registered voters, you can predict how many people are going to vote. We know that reliably about 40% of African American voters vote Democrat, and non-African American minorities split evenly between the two parties. I live in an area that is overwhelmingly Hispanic in Norcross. Probably 40% of the people in, in my part of Norcross are Hispanic. Uh, large Asian population, but if you look at the voter database, the, the Hispanics, most of them are illegal. They can't vote, and so so yeah, I can go. I can find you the best authentic Mexican food anywhere within an hour drive, but there are more people from China and Korea that vote than are people from Mexico, and even of those people that are Hispanic that vote, a lot of them are from South America. A lot of them have been here for more than 10 years. And so sometimes the, the um, driving through the neighborhood doesn't give you the, the right feel. Uh, there's, you don't see a lot of African Americans, but when you look at the voter rolls, there, there are at least 45, there are more African American voters in my house district than, than white voters. And, and so it's just, uh, just the nature of, of, the, of the numbers are different. But, um, and the thing about non-white non -white minorities, um, there are plenty of minorities that are strong Republicans. There's plenty of minorities that are strong Democrats. It's more more compute, more complex than people. And if you say that an Hispanic will never vote Republican, I'll say, well, go down to South Florida and talk to them, who have relatives in the prisons in Cuba, and anybody who hates Castro the most is going to get their vote. Or for that matter, Vietnamese and Cambodians who have relatives that fought in the Vietnam War who felt Jimmy Carter betrayed them by, by not letting them come to the United States. And so you have, so the, the, the non-African American minorities are pretty much split between the two. Hispanics who live in Republican areas vote Republican. Hispanics who vote in Democrat areas vote Democrat. Asians are, 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 are also split economically. Those that have more money are, are more likely Republicans. Those that are that are not, don't quite have quite as much money are more likely to vote Democrat, but, um, but again, it's somewhat located as well. My calculations, I estimate 2.3 to 2.4 people will vote in Georgia, 26% will be African American, less than 5% will be other minorities, that gives you 64% will be white, 69% will be white. If 60% of the African Americans vote Democrat, and half the non-African American minorities vote Democrat. The Democrats will need almost 600,000 white votes to win, or roughly 35% of the white vote, if 2.4 million people vote. Yes. And you ask, does the farms have a shot? Well, 80% of all the prim white primary voters in the G vote in the GOP primary this year. There was an African American candidate running for labor commissioner as a Republican, a guy by the name of Mitt Everson. He received more white votes than any African American running as a Democrat. He won over 150,000 white votes in the Republican primary, and that was just a, a, that was about as many as, as whites that voted in the whole Democrat primary statewide. And so it's it's. Um, um, yeah, um, and there's an old saying that uh, found a bed with a live boy or dead girl, that type of thing. 
Um, now, things could be messed. Deal and could be sent to jail. Um, it, somebody could be hit by a car. Uh, Barnes could be uh, could decide that he wins the lottery and says he's going to write a check to everybody and pay for the debt itself. Um, but the thing is that both part both candidates know this. Both candidates are during their campaign toward uh, and polling will tell them this as well. Toward, well, if I'm the Democrat, I need to increase the African American turnout from 26 to 30. If I'm Barnes, I need to find one out of three voter, one out of three whites need to vote for me. I need to find those people somewhere. Where do I find them? Rural farms, people in suburban areas, uh, things of that nature. And if you watch the ads, sometimes ask why do they present that ad that way? And that will sort of, and if you know sort of what, what they need to do to win, you sort of understand that. Do I have another one or, oh, I have one more. One more. Great story, love story. 1948 presidential election. Anybody know who's won the, the 48 presidential election? Truman. But there's a famous picture of Truman holding the Chicago Tribune saying, Dewey wins. <laughs> the, what happened, yeah, what happened was the pollsters relied only on phone interviews. And rich Republicans had phones, poor Democrats didn't back then. Not everybody had a phone of 48. So the poll was extremely biased. And they knew the election was going to be very close anyway. But, uh, but the poll said Dewey's going to win. And the reality was they didn't weight it properly. They didn't survey enough people who did not have phones to, to make, make it valid. And, and so the, the, um, the extra was, was wrong. Um, do you have any questions on polling or elections or things of that nature? Well, what what they do is, and this a present company accepted. I'm not a big fan of journalists mm -hmm. because they want things that, that are flashy that they can put on the screen very quickly. And, and if they make a mistake, then usually it's forgotten very quickly. And so what they'll do is they'll go through and they'll say, we know that a certain part of, of um, New York, that the Republican gets less than 30% of the vote, then it's, he's going to lose the whole state. He needs at least 30%. Or we have an area where the Democrats need so many votes and, or, and, and you extrapolate that across the whole state. That they need to make a certain certain uh, result, certain uh, uh, percentage of votes in a certain area of New York or, or Massachusetts or Georgia. Um, if they go th like in Georgia, if I was going to work with AJC and I was going to do this for them, I'd go out and I'd survey um, African Americans in the urban area, and I'd have one column how the African American urban area vote. Uh, I'd inter interview uh, white suburbanites and have another column. And those will all be weighted. I think a certain percentage are going to be in this group, a certain percentage in that, and I could create my formula. And then once the surveys came in, I plug in a formula, and if it was above a certain line, I knew one side was going to win. If it was below, I knew the other side was going to win. And in elections that are close, they almost always get that wrong. In elections that are that are that are going to be lighted, then they can they can call the election early. Um, that's obvious. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. And I mean, like, like if, um, if Barnes wins Gwinnett County, he's gonna, he's gonna win the state. Yeah. But by the same token, and, and if, if Deal loses the cab by under 20,000, then he's gonna win. Uh, one of the races I worked in, it was in a county that we knew we were gonna lose. But we expected to lose it by 10,000, we lost it by 1,000. And we knew that when we, when we got the result that we lost by 1,000, we said we already won the elections. We, because any one of these small rural counties is going to make out for the difference. And, and, and they says, well, explain it. They says, well, it's sort of complicated, but we closed the margin to the point where for, when you spread it out across the state, then they can't, then we can easily make up whatever we lose. Um, but, but that's sort of how they do it. 
and and they don't always get it right. And Florida's example, I remember a Senate race in New Hampshire where they called it for one guy, and then they switched, and they said it was too like too close to call, and then they gave it to the guy that originally they thought lost. And um, but uh, but I don't know. It's it's yeah. Um, I wonder if you have a candidate who has more money than the time. Not always. The, 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 the most important thing to win an election is votes. Everything else can be translated to votes. The more, the more money you have, the, if you have money but no, no votes, you're going to lose. And so some people are in a bigger, bigger hole to dig themselves out in. They don't have enough to, of, to build themselves out. There a, the county chairman in Gwinnett County resigned a few days ago. And uh, he was about ready to be indicted. And rumor is he may still be indicted, but he is that if he steps down, he might not be punished as severely. Now, just because he had a lot of money in his political coffers and he could raise a lot of money, uh, his career is over. He, he will never, because the, the allegations are so severe and the things he's involved in are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty questionable. And so no amount of money is going to help him win. You need enough money to be competitive, and once you become competitive, then uh, then other factors come into play. You need about half as much if you're if you're outspent. You need about half as much as your opponent to be competitive. So if a guy has a million, I need five hundred thousand. Uh, Barnes may have more money than Deal, and he definitely had more money than Purdue eight years ago. But um, but he had a look, but. His opponent made it made an argument, and we deal. Barnes is behind, but he may have plenty of money. But he may be so far behind that he can't move that he can't move the, the goalpost fast enough. But so, so you need enough to make a difference. So you don't need. now. How much do you need for for uh, a house race? Uh, depends how many votes you need. Usually they say three or four dollars per vote. If you have a big district, you need more votes than a small district. You know. Um, I know people that have run competitive races for $10,000. They did everything on the cheap, but they were had enough money to make the argument that they deserved to win. I know. Yeah. Churches, yeah. churches can't give you money, but what they can do is make introductions. One of the most powerful church leaders in Cap County is Eddie Long. And no one wants him to do a fundraiser for him. <laughs> but there was a time when he was very powerful. And, 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 and that's a different lecture over your time. But what would happen is he would go into the church and says, um, I can't endorse this guy, but he's a friend of mine. And he's going to sit next to me, and everybody's going to get the message. And other groups will do that. There, there are um, uh, the gay community is very powerful in Atlanta. Uh, the, uh, both sides of the abortion debate are, are very small but very powerful. Um, but, what, and one of the, I'm trying to get back to polling for one thing. One of the things polling will do is I can survey on the issues and I can find that maybe the issue, the reason I'm running, only 5% of people care about. And so maybe that's not the issue I'm going to talk about, even though I care about it. I'll talk about what they care about. Young people, jobs, middle-aged people, education when they have school-aged kids. Older people don't care about jobs because they're retired, so they care about security and health care. And so those things may not be as important as my important issues, but the polling will tell me what I really should talk about. I was at a, um, uh, I was at a Muslim function about four or six years ago, a political rally, people were speaking. And a uh, candidate was running for office, had her stump speech that she gave at every function. It was the same stump speech she'd always give. So she stood up and she said, you know, I'm the biggest fan of Israel. I love Israel. <laughs> I'm not Jewish, but I love the Jewish people. <laughs> and now, now I, 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 don't, I don't have anything wrong against 
Israel, and, and I am Jewish from 200 years ago. My relatives may have been Jewish, but that wasn't what I would have talked about. <laughs> no, she she was politically stupid, but she was, and, and she lost. But I but I know another guy who went up who was just as much a pro supporter of Israel as the first person. He went up and he talked about two issues, and only two issues, and those are issues where they agree with him 100. percent He says. I believe that you shouldn't discriminate against religion. Uh, and so if one group gets something, you're going to get it. And if you get something, they'll get it. And I'm going to make, I'm not a big supporter of giving you benefits and giving them benefits, but if they get something, I'm going to make sure you have a seat at the table. And that's what, that's all I wanted to hear. And he didn't tell about the fact that he has a Jewish grandmother and, and, <laughs> and speaks Hebrew. He, he just talked about e- equality. And, and so, and, the, and if he had pulled those people, he would have known that she would have known. But anyway, um, trying to leave it on something a little humorous. Any more questions? Any questions from the, uh, from the uh, gallery online? Yeah, gallery online? Yes. Hey, just Jim? Yes. Urban yeah. Gone? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mike? Yes, I can hear you a little bit. I can hear you a little bit. Okay. My, uh, oh. I had to get up for a minute, so you may have covered this. But what about the fact that people don't have land landlines anymore? Is do you have some way of controlling for the fact that cell phones are so common only? Well, we can only call landlines legally, and um, but there's still enough people with landlines that you can get a valid poll. And but another issue is people who, uh, in poor economic times, don't answer the phone from, for strangers. Um, my house, we have a landline, and it's turned off, and we only answer our cell phones. And the only reason why I have a landline is for cable. And so I'm on all of these political call lists, but I don't, we don't answer that line anymore. And so that's actually becoming the real issue. Areas that have a high level of poverty or economic challenge, to be a little more polite, tend to uh, not have a lot of have a lot of bad phone numbers, not get a lot of responses. Uh, we called Atlanta. We got 2% bad phone numbers, and we we try to we try to kick out all the bad phone numbers so the next time we call, it's not as bad. A uh, friend of mine called did a did a survey in the downtown uh, Detroit. More than 50% of all the numbers that were on his list were bad, were turned off for one reason or another, disconnected. And it wasn't because these people were rich and had cell phones. It was because these people were poor and, and, and couldn't afford it or weren't, had everything turned off so the bill collectors wouldn't catch them. And so, and so some, some areas are, are harder to get, to get numbers, numbers than others. Uh, the technology will change. Uh, Ten years from now, we may be doing polling online, but I don't think it's something that will be done right now because not everybody has an email address. Okay. Any more questions? But emails, if they don't get it, they put you in the spam folder. <laughs> and there are, and you can lose your privileges to email if you, uh, because we, one of the things my firm does too is we try to match email addresses with voters and it has not been perfected yet. Let's put it that way. <laughs> For, okay, that's fine. That's it. Okay. Oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, you can ever you can send to me and you can you can um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook, you can find me. The the new thing now is to create Facebook site of